ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I welcome you from all um, five continents. We have tonight four excellent speakers from uh, Canada and uh, Europe. I will introduce them in, in a minute. This is an educational activity that has been funded by Faring Pharmaceutical. Uh, we have uh, four webinars uh, this uh, year, and we are now approaching mod module two, how to manage CVD risk in prostate cancer patients during the pandemic uh, COVID-19 ongoing. So I am very happy to um, share this session and welcome all the attendees, said almost 500 uh, participants from 85 countries. Um, the next slide, can I have it, um, please? The five speakers tonight, um, I'm happy to introduce to you Professor Ayun Ghosh, uh, who is from the um, uh, University of London, and uh, he is a cardiologist, very much involved in cardio-oncology. Uh, professor Marie Rival is um, a professor of urology from Barcelona, and uh, she's well known in the uh, European Association of Urology as uh, vice chairman of our guidelines committee. Ricardo Rendon is a um, uh, um, urologist from uh, Canada, and he is uh, from uh, uh, Halifax um, in Canada, and the practicing urologist, and very much involved in uh, now um, uh, CV events, but also uh, COVID-19 data. Uh, the last speaker will be um, uh, Dr. Mark Lynch from uh, um, University of London, who is um, a medical oncologist. So welcome everybody, and we are now approaching the first presentation by Professor Arjun Ghosh. And uh, welcome to present to us uh, your talk. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll just get my presentation up. I um, hope everyone can um, see this. So thank you very much for the invitation to talk today about COVID-19 and cardio-oncology and the impact, of course, on prostate cancer patients. So this is something that has affected the whole world. And this is something that we looked at from the international perspective, how COVID-19 affected cardio-oncology practice. And we, we did an international survey and um, published this recently. And we looked at a variety of aspects of cardiac care and cardio-oncology care specifically. And as you can see here in uh, this figure, the rescheduling of outpatient appointments was almost universal across US, the blue bar, across Europe, the orange bar, and in Latin America, the gray bar. And most elective procedures, as you see in the middle set of columns, was canceled. And there was also decreased use of the normal diagnostic cardiac imaging modalities such as echo, CT, MR. And this, of course, had a massive impact on the management of cancer patients from the cardiac perspective. So what to do about this? This was obviously a big problem. So we, we looked at this situation and um, we published this looking at how to manage the situation in cardio-oncology with COVID. So this is the diagram or the figure that we came up with to look at patient flow in the context of COVID-19. When a patient has a new diagnosis of cancer or if they're a cancer survivor, they would normally go to their GP or to their oncologist. At that point, if they had a cardiac issue, we would recommend a cardiac triage. And this would be, of course, a virtual triage given that it was COVID-19. And the virtual triage would include the historical um, data. It would include any biomarkers or any tests that they've already had. Now, depending upon the situation, they would either have a virtual clinic consult with the cardio-oncology physician or with the cardio-oncology specialist nurse. And then at that consultation, they would have a risk assessment. And depending upon their cardiac risk, they would be then assigned to an in-person review thereafter, or they would have another virtual review. So cardiac risk assessment is really the key in this situation. So this brings me, oops, this brings me to the first question. How would we assess cardiac risk in prostate cancer patients? So if we're going for the augmented ABCD approach to cardiovascular risk assessment in prostate cancer patients, which of the following Cs is actually not included? Is it cigarettes, cholesterol, cardiac CT or cardiac imaging, or chronotropic assessment? So if you could vote now, please. 
Okay, great. So um, the results, uh, so the majority think that it's chronotropic assessment. Uh, that's followed by cardiac imaging and cholesterol and cigarettes were tied at last. So the majority did give the right answer, chronotropic assessment. So let's uh, move on to that. Uh, my slide seems to have frozen. Okay, great. So this is the ABCD approach, and this follows on from what's recommended by the American Heart Association for assessing cardiovascular risk. So A would stand for awareness of the cardiovascular risk with a lot of the prostate treatments. Aspirin and arrhythmias would often be given in these patients. B stands for biomarker assessment and blood pressure assessment. C stands for cigarettes, cholesterol, and cardiac imaging. So chronotropic assessment is not part of the uh, C group. D stands for diet, diabetes, and the choice of drug, because obviously which drug is being prescribed from the cancer point of view will have an impact on the cardiac side of things. And E stands for exercise, ECG, and exposure. So this comes on, uh, brings me on to the second question. In terms of the cardiovascular complications that we would like to assess with prostate cancer treatment from the cardiac side, which of the following is not a common potential complication of prostate cancer treatment? Is it valvular heart disease, hypertension, myocardial infarction, or arrhythmia? Please vote now. Okay, so the vast majority have gone for valvular heart disease, 77%, which is the correct answer. So let's move on to the explanation. So these are the common complications of prostate cancer treatment from the cardiovascular side. Myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, hypertension, arrhythmia, stroke. You know, th these are common complications. Valvular heart disease is not really associated with any of the prostate cancer treatments. So in terms of the cardio-oncology care, we divided this into different phases, um, depending upon the situation in terms of the pandemic. When the COVID-19 was in the pandemic, when we were in the middle of a very strict lockdown, it was really very much emergency care only. And this, of course, had a massive impact on both cancer diagnosis and the management of the cardiac issues with cancer patients. When there was the initial recovery, it was a semi-elective uh, patients that were reviewed, semi-elective uh, tests to, could take place such as echocardiography and uh, cardiac MRI and other investigations. And in the recovery phase, um, things are probably going to go a little bit back to where things were before COVID. But I think some new changes that have been introduced such as virtual clinics are likely to stay. A lot of patients actually found it quite convenient not to have to travel. Cancer patients have multiple appointments for clinic visits, blood tests, imaging tests. So one less physical appointment is actually of an advantage to them. So probably, you know, this is something that will stay to an extent. So in summary, uh, COVID-19 has had a very big impact on cardio-oncology services. The impact has been on the pre-assessment of these patients, on the monitoring of the cancer patients, and also has had an impact on late effects clinics and services. Services at the moment are getting back to normal in the UK from the cardio-oncology perspective. And the augmented ABCD approach can help in all stages of the management of prostate cancer patients. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Um... Uh, Arjun, for this presentation, uh, reflecting what's going on in your field of expertise. I would guess you are a cardiologist rather than a pure uh, cardiologist, right? So, uh, do you hear, you hear me now? So, let's find out like, if we have any questions from all our attendees around the world. Otherwise, I have a question for you because you say uh, that in the UK it's back to normal. That's pretty much in terms of cardiology, correct? Yeah, and also in terms of a lot of the um, cancer uh, follow-ups and the new patient appointments, a lot of the cancer treatments. So we, we are in the middle of the third lockdown at the moment in the UK. And I think um, the approach that we've had has been very different in the three lockdowns. In the first lockdown, it was very much, if you remember the graph I showed, the emergency treatment only. And in um, this lockdown, there was a conscious effort by the government to say that actually 
Um, cardiac treatment should continue as much as normal as possible. Cancer treatment should continue as far as normal as possible. And the reason being was there were a lot of studies that came out that showed a lot of patients were not being diagnosed with cancer. They were, you know, staying at home. They were afraid and cancer diagnoses were being missed. Um, heart attacks were being missed. Patients were too scared to come in hospital. So this, this time there was a concerted effort to try and have services running as far as normal as possible. But have you seen also various, um, various um, less um, patients sent to you and your center from practicing urologists in the UK? Yeah, so I think um, definitely in the first phase, that was absolutely true. But as things have moved forward, um, we've definitely got the referrals back. And, you know, I did clinic this morning and the clinic was, you know, uh, overbooked. Uh, so we are trying to, to get back to normal, including the prostate cancer patients. And Mark, one of the speakers on this uh, talk, uh, he definitely keeps me busy with his referrals. Hmm. That's something we discussed in the first webinar and that we actually, as practicing urologists, we do less cardiac triage, uh, as you pointed out in one of your slides. We are not that familiar with go through all the uh, medicine uh, the, the patient is on, especially if you are looking at uh, uh, drugs related to cardiac diseases, uh, and especially if you have a, a, we are taking aspirins or any other drugs related to that. And uh, of course, we don't always ask a very relevant question whether the patient is smoking or not. Uh, so I think there is a, a place for learning um, among urologists rather than. Uh, other specialities in this effect. Uh, do we have any any uh, last question for any of the faculty members? Oh, if not, uh, we have to proceed. And uh, thank you very much once again, Dr. Bosch. Please end us uh, end up in the end because there will be some discussions we need you to inv be involved in. So to say, we continue. Uh, any questions now? No. Otherwise, we continue with. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Maria Ribal's um, presentation. As I said earlier, um, Barcelona is um, a very interesting place at present, and uh, Maria is a truly a Catalan lady. She's going to present a little bit about um, recommendations from the EAU guidelines. Uh, she is co-chairman of our guidelines um, under the umbrella of the European Association of Urology. So, Maria, are you ready to give your presentation? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you. Although virtually, uh, we are learning a lot about virtual communication. I will explain to you which has been the, the changes done on the guidance recommendation for the COVID period. I will cover the localized disease since uh, uh, the high risk and metastatic disease will be covered by my colleagues. And the first we should set is those recommendations are not really based on uh, high level evidence because there's no high level evidence how to react in a situation like the pandemic was. So uh, what it was done is just to commissionate a group that uh, tried to put to work all the panel members all together and uh, take advantage of how the guidelines already work. Since we have uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams, we have representations of uh, all over the world and uh, we, use, uh, we are used to work with uh, uh, Cochrane methodology. And uh, what we decide is let's try to find some kind of consensus among all these uh, great people working on the guidelines and try to help how to deal with prostate cancer under this situation. So a group was commissioned that uh, this group, what we did is just to create a protocol on how to prioritize the, the, the recommendations in low priority. If there's no harm in six months if it whatever, diagnosis, therapy, or follow-up is postponed for six months, intermediate priority if it's postponed for three, four months, high priority could not be postponed an emergency. The criteria we gave them for the prioritization uh, was criteria based on the disease on the disease itself and criteria based on the pandemic. On the disease, it means uh, take into account uh, the delay on primary uncle outcomes as uh, overall survival, cancer-specific survival, survival, et cetera, take into account the comorbidities, take it in, into account the possible complications, et cetera. And uh, criteria coming from the pandemic uh, were based, for example, in the resources uh, we have, 
uh, in the capability of our hospitals to attend the patients uh, which were considered interventions more difficult than the others, etc. So the recommendations came and were peer reviewed first for the for the um, rapid group itself, just to uniform uniform size all the all the appearance, but also uh, for the representatives of the section offices were seven experts, three in non-onco and three in non-onco, and they gave their opinion on the recommendation. So it was based, all of them, in a true consensus that were published in our website and European Urology. We gave recommendations based on the localized disease because I will comment only on localized prostate cancer. Uh, you can find recommendations on surgical procedures itself, for example, how to use the ventilator, how to use the monocular electrosurgery, which were the recommendations for robotics, etc. Uh, there were built also recommendations on, uh, for example, how to test patients to be submitted to surgery, for example, and also how to, to follow the, those patients. And for example, telemedicine. Uh, has been something that uh, was clearly uh, born, not born, but uh, increased during the pandemic and probably will stay. So which were the recommendations, specific recommendations for the localized disease? So this one is the easiest part. My colleagues have the, the difficult one. Uh, obviously that we can defer the diagnosis of a very low risk disease for six months, but, oh, sorry for that, but in a high priority, if we have a suspicious of a metastatic disease, then it's a high priority. How to treat? Obviously active surveillance can be, can be postponed. And for intermediate, what we said in the, our guidelines is that, is that, um, is an intermediate priority that we should uh, treat uh, with not more than three, four months delay, that the radical prostatectomy could be delayed for three, four months in this supposed of intermediate risk, that don't use muatuan androgen deprivation in the case that you have a surgery uh, foreseen, that if you have uh, a radiotherapy foreseen for this intermediate disease, then use hypofractionation, and starting the neoadjuvant ADP that could be prolonged for six months and avoid uh, invasive procedures. And also try to postpone the treatment with brachytherapy. Uh, my final message is that look at this is what happens in my area. The diagnosis of prostate cancer has been decreasing nearly 30% and kidney cancer 40%. So when we uh, it's not as important to revert the recommendations, but how to deal with the second pandemic that, it, as it has been said before, it will be the, those diseases that we have not treated, we have not diagnosed, so, so this will be hard. This is my question for you. Uh, which one is the correct answer? So uh, we can launch the poll and we can comment after uh, with all the the panelists and the audience, if you want to comment on. I think that the polling is coming. Yes. Uh, here. Wow. OK. Uh, well, it's a mix of, of answers. Uh, I will tell you which one uh, is, the, is the correct in the, in the EAU guidelines recommendation for the COVID period, is that still neoadjuvant androgen deprivation is strongly not recommended before surgery. Uh, so uh, even in a pandemic situation, the neoadjuvant therapy before surgery is not recommended. As you know, this is a strong recommendation coming from the guidelines itself, not on the, under the pandemic, but the, the guidelines even in 2021 update. So uh, we strongly recommend to, to follow this recommendation even in this critical situation. I don't know if there's any question on the, on the audience. Or I doubt whether by, by, by our uh, uh, chairman. Yes, let's start. Uh, whoever, do you hear me now? Yes, yeah. but I cannot see you. Huh? I don't no. rather prefer to, to see you. 
let's see. I don't know whether we have any answers um, uh, or questions um, to your um, presentation, uh, Maria. Um, do you read me now? Yes, here we go. No, no. Maria, do we have uh, any questions reflecting what you said, Maria? At least I have um, a couple of questions for you. You said that one concern I have is actually a special patient group with uh, low risk disease on active surveillance. Uh, if we delay our checkups too long, it may be a risk in the long term run, but I don't think it's high risk. But how do we cope with that care of the patients, Maria? Well, for active surveillance, in fact, you can delay the follow-up for six months because it's the period that you already established for follow-up. So mm -hmm. it's uh, not difficult. And I completely agree with uh, uh, Arjun that uh, we are learning from the, the previous wave. And for example, also in our hospital, we are now taking care on not delaying oncological procedures, etc. So we are rescheduling everything. We are facing the fourth wave here in Barcelona. So, uh, and we maintain as a priority the oncology, but for sure that we will have a delay in a global diagnosis in prostate cancer. And uh, it's not the low risk disease what uh, worries the most, but uh, the high risk, for example, or metastatic disease. Well, if there is um, a patient on active surveilling with rising PSA and other perhaps parameters that uh, create an incident or create actually uh, a role for um, re-biopsy, um, perhaps followed also by MRI. If you, we talk about re-biopsy, it's very, of course, uh, an increase in risk if you have a COVID. So I think testing should be mandatory in these patients. Yes, because, sure. Um, and unfortunately, we'd have problems with testing around the world. I think how is the situation in Spain in general? For testing uh, patients, patients that are going to be submitted to uh, any procedure are all of them being tested, mm -hmm. but uh, not in a general population, if you mean that, in the general no. population. No, not... we're talking about prostate cancer. No, patients. no, no. For prostate cancer, we, we can test them. Mm -hmm. All the patients that goes to surgery or goes to invasive procedures, all of them are tested. Mm -hmm. For example, now we have started a, a campaign for vaccination in our hospital, and we are going to give priority to all oncological patients that have already received an oncological therapy, systemic therapy in the last year. All right. So, if you talk about decreasing, decreasing incidents, like you, you uh, uh, showed from Catalan territory in Spain, um, we have also found that, interestingly, in most Nordic countries in Scandinavia, less than, uh, well, less than 35%, a little bit more than you find. But have you found also a decrease recently that the incidence of prostate cancer is going down? Mm, not, not generally, just only because of the COVID. Yes. And, and, and yes, because of the COVID, uh, the, the decrease is uh, 30%, and for renal cancer is 42%. Okay. So uh, uh, we are trying in our area also to work on that, not only for the COVID, but we are trying to, to, to implement the screening, uh, rational screening uh, schema that the EAU is already defending. So uh, because we have been under the rules of USPTF for a long time, and we are trying to convert this because for example, metastatic disease in our area has increased in the last years uh, from 6% uh, till uh, even 15%. So it, it will be worse after the pandemic, I would say. Well, there is actually one question regarding CVD com complication. It's relationship to, relation to COVID effects, uh, rationale for not recommending the adjuvant ADT for intermediate prostate, prostate cancer risk patients. Uh, well, no, the, the recommendation of uh, no using uh, ADT as a new adjuvant setting is mm. because it's, it's a strong recommendation, a general strong recommendation on prostate cancer uh, guidelines uh, because there's no effect in overall survival, there's no effect in uh, progression free survival. So there's no study that has already demonstrated an improvement of the use of the new adjuvant therapy uh, hormone. New, new adjuvant therapy in prostate cancer. And now we have studies using docetaxel, for example, that has not demonstrated any effect in the new adjuvant setting. Also. No, that's, that's true. That study was actually coming out of my university and my department once. But uh, we, we come back to that issue a little bit later. Uh, the two other speakers will also attack that uh, question coming in. Yeah. Um, any contraindication for COVID vaccine? One uh, attendee is asking. Um, patients are waiting, receiving radiotherapy. 
we have no any formal contraindication for the vaccine, except you are allergic and we don't know who, who they are. So uh, uh, not for oncological patients, all of them are already uh, recommended uh, to be submitted to the vaccine. We don't uh, actually discuss whether or not one vaccine is better than the other, then we are uh, hitting uh, deep water. That's not Absolutely. my job here today, yeah? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you very much. I think we better say good time. We have actually two or three minutes left, left. Do we have any any remaining question to Maria Rebal, actually from the faculty members? Please um, announce it, put your phone on. Maria, it's uh, Ricardo here. Uh, what about MRI services, or maybe for everyone in the panel, uh, were they severely decreased? Because we were quite affected by MRI usage particularly. Yes, it's true. In the first part of the pandemic, in March last year, we had uh, very important problems with not, not MRI, but also CT scans, for example. Yeah. So, because uh, all of them were already used for diagnosing the COVID. So uh, uh, there was a great problem on that. Uh, now, uh, since we are learning from one wave to another, we are trying to create some kind of mechanisms to understand which patients should be submitted to imaging uh, with priority. So we are learning uh, not to collapse everything and to create some kind of priority. But mm -hmm. it's true that at the very beginning, we have a long delay on imaging. Yeah, one thing that we did here as well, it was uh, we met with the Department of uh, uh, radiation, uh, Radiology. And uh, so now we have to add a lot more clinical information and the rationale for the timing, which is something that we just used to request an MRI or something. So I think it's something good is gonna come out of this because I think all this information is gonna help the radiologist report better we do the same we do yeah. the same any more questions from the panelists no questions from uh, mark lynch or uh, we are coming back to some of the issues regarding uh, hormones and uh, RDT and cv risk etc later um i don't think we have more questions from the attendees actually um, we have one we have time for it actually i think this is one uh, no, we're going to answer that question later, possibly. Okay, Maria, thank you so much for sticking to the time and uh, some very good slides and presentation, indeed. So we move thank on, you. actually, thank you. So we move on to uh, the next uh, uh, professor, uh, Ricardo Rendon from Halifax in Canada. And he is a practicing urologic oncologist. And uh, so managing localized local advanced disease with, um, in terms of high-risk prostate cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please welcome uh, Ricardo Rendon. Thank you, Professor Abramson. So uh, the CUA is uh, uh, very excited to work with ICOS and, and EUA. We've been collaborating with EUA uh, for quite a while, but now doing an educational event, uh, we're very excited. So um, just like every other uh, group in the world, we started to look at this problem from an acute uh, phase uh, point of view, and we were all start to uh, started to uh, scramble um, what we were going to do and make uh, recommendations in our specific areas because uh, we all have a very different uh, healthcare system. So um, what we produced back in uh, March of uh, this uh, 2020, it was a multidisciplinary uh, group, including medical oncology, radiation oncology, urologic oncology, radiology pathology, and those are our Canadian guidelines uh, that were posted in our website and uh, they were published. There were multiple other guidelines, including uh, the EAU guidelines as uh, Maria uh, just uh, presented. And there is a recent international consensus. Uh, it wasn't very clear to me. It was just published in November of 2020 in BJUI. And as it wasn't clear to me as how it was uh, established a consensus and that uh, we'll talk a little bit about that consensus and multiple other ones. So just a couple of things that I'd like to address. One is we have, we're clinicians and we have to remember our patients come first. 
and there, the COVID pandemic has reshaped social structures and healthcare delivery uh, completely. So, and we're all learning as, as we go. And it has been shown clearly that uh, we have to be very careful with the psychological stress of the patients, not only the one placed by the pandemic, but also cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, and you have to add to that the cancer delay. So we still have to stay more in tune. So my job for today was to discuss surgical and uh, radiation therapy considerations for uh, very high risk and high risk disease. So I have a question first. Let's assume that in your center, the waiting time for surgery for prostate cancer is, is long. And what would you be your ideal treatment for a 55 year old man with a Gleason 8 large volume, PSA of 17, and clinical uh, stage T to be with no metastasis. So one, would it be close active surveillance with PSA and MRI or neoadjuvant uh, ADT followed by surgery, referral for surgery to a regional COVID free center, ADT with hyperfractionation EBRT or high dose rate brachytherapy plus external beam radiation plus minus ADT. You can vote now. So this is a 55 year old man with a uh, high risk uh, prostate cancer, Gleason 8, and a PSA of 17. Uh, so please uh, vote uh, now. Okay, so uh, that's a good point. Uh, uh, referral for surgery to a regional COVID free uh, center. Um, and the second one was ADT plus hyperfractionation. So I can see that, uh, that Maria already made an impact in the audience. Um, So this is a good concept. I, we haven't been able to uh, develop that in Canada, but uh, there's a recent, uh, recent publication showing that urological con consultations uh, and surgery should ideally be centralized in a tertiary urological center that should uh, remain free of COVID, or if not, create a path in a particular sur uh, surgery a hospital that is free of COVID. I am not aware of any uh, center like this in Canada, and maybe uh, we can discuss later to see if uh, there are any other examples around the world that can uh, help us uh, figure out how to do this. In terms of uh, surgery, there is uh, plenty of data uh, showing that a delay from three to six months is not gonna make a difference in the long-term results. Our recommendation was to consider a uh, delay for up to three to six months uh, from diagnosis. Maria just covered this. So we do not recommend the use of ADT prior to radical prostatectomy. There are several trials on this. We had a Canadian trial, uh, a prospective randomized trial where there was no difference uh, in survival or cancer specific survival uh, between new adjuvant uh, hormone therapy versus uh, just uh, surgery alone. So we don't use, uh, use uh, new adjuvant uh, deprivation therapy, uh, but we would consider um, uh, strongly if uh, the so, but, but, but consider if the patient requires a long delay uh, for high risk prostate cancer in patients who are not candidates for surgery. This is the consensus that I uh, was alluding to uh, published by in the BGUI. And this is one of the things that they recommended is that if the patient has high risk disease and there's a perceived delay, they recommend uh, hormone therapy. But out of all the consensus statements that are published out there, this is the only one that recommends that. So I would strongly uh, recommend, or our group would strongly recommend against um, hormone therapy. Uh, there is no data uh, to uh, show that there is survival or cardiac specific survival advantage, and there is also increased risk of complications. One thing that uh, was very topical for all of us who are surgeons is as to whether there was be there was going to be increased risk of aerosolization of uh, uh, COVID by laparoscopic surgery. And we learned a lot of uh, uh, filters, and there are different filters in the market. And uh, what we recommended is you had to look at your own filters and make sure that your filter was the right one. There was a recent systematic review where they showed that there is no scientific evidence to date for the transmission of COVID-19 by laparoscopic surgery. So I presume that um, everywhere else in the world, those uh, fears of laparoscopic uh, surgery transmission have decreased. 
In terms of radiation therapy, again, for high-risk disease, I, I have a question first. So this is a 68-year-old man who presented with a Gleason 7 in four out of 12 cores, PSA of 13. The patient is not interested in surgery. How would you treat this patient? So it's a Gleason 7, 4 out of 12. So it's intermediate, unfavorable risk prostate cancer. Close surveillance or high dose rate brachytherapy plus minus ADT or ADT hyperfractionation with EBR, uh, ABRT or ADT plus EBRT and fiducial markers and rectal spacers as we use in common practice. You can vote now. Okay, so again, uh, ADT and hyperfractionation, uh, that would be our choice, uh, Ben, in our recommendations. Uh, there is another uh, possibility, which is that with the fiducial markers, but we'll talk about that in one second. So uh, our recommendations are uh, based in uh, current guidelines. As, as you know, the RTOG 9910 uh, study showed that at least four months of uh, hormones are adequate for unfavorable um, intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer. So that would be our recommendation. And those patients who have high risk prostate cancer should start ADT. And the recommendation has been about nine months of ADT, at least in the current pandemic. There is a recent study that was uh, published in JAM Oncology where uh, they looked in the US at uh, 10 years worth of data and 11,000 deaths of patients with high risk prostate cancer or very high risk prostate cancer. And you can see here in the right side panel, you look at this is the time of initiation of hormones relative to um, so radiation relative to the initiation of hormones. And you can see this is 60 days before um, uh, receiving radiation. This is at the time of radiation, at the end, 180 days. And there is no difference in a 10-year overall survival the, uh, based on the timing of initiation of hormones. So a good period of time of hormones is okay. So you don't have to worry too much about making the patients wait nine versus 12 months versus six months for these patients with higher risk uh, prostate cancer. In terms of technical aspects, so one of the answers, uh, some people answer what would be the standard of care, which is using fiducial markers or rectal spacers, but these are not recommended overall. So, because we want to decrease invasive procedures or procedures requiring uh, general anesthetic. Uh, the other um, thing that we're using now is uh, obviously external beam radiation therapy. And we have been moving towards hyperfractionated protocols, but with the uh, COVID pandemic, we have increased the use and accelerated and solidified the use of hyperfractionated uh, protocols. And this has become the standard of care um, um, worldwide. And that's what I had to uh, share with you. I don't know if there are any questions. I hope the the, the new adjuvant ADT pre surgery. I think is uh, where is well established that it shouldn't be recommended. Although there is a recent paper showing that. Ricardo, can, can I ask a question? It's, it's Mark Mark Lynch here from UCL. Uh, so just just to revisit what both you and Maria have been saying about this new adjuvant hormones. So you you both said quite firmly that there's no evidence of benefit from neoadjuvant hormones, and I totally accept that. But actually, during the first wave, we, we had a really unprecedented situation whereby we were having to delay surgery. And the question we are asking isn't, is there benefit in a normal situation? We're saying we're going to have to delay all these patients. Is there anything that we can do to provide a stopgap because we have no alternative? Um, and so I, th I, think, I don't think it was an evidence-free zone. Have you any comments right. about that? So yeah, so we consider that and, and uh, initially and, and for many years that we've been practicing, if you have someone that's uh, waiting a bit too uncomfortably for the surgery, we sometimes talk about hormones, but there was really strong data against it from an overall survival point of view. So now uh, a few months earlier, we were put in this uh, into this conundrum and we had to make decisions. What we decided is that there are alternatives as opposed to uh, 12 centimeter renal mass 
um, there are alternatives to surgery. And uh, in an acute phase of a pandemic, we thought uh, uh, external beam radiation in most of the patients who are candidate for it was a better uh, solution. Ricardo, one issue I would like to address in high-risk prostate cancer patients, those patients being truly um, candidates to surgery. And of course, we favor that as practicing urologists. But uh, what about, uh, you said, uh, no neoadjuvant treatment whatsoever in this case of the patient. And you related to a number of trials uh, in addition to uh, what has been published more recently. But this, this is an issue we discussed already in the 90s, uh, more than 30 years ago. And there are a number of randomized trials that clearly demonstrated no benefit in terms of overall survival. But in order to, uh, to, do, to calm down our patients with high-risk prostate cancer and delay in terms of radical prostatectomy, what should we do? I mean, there's a clearly um, a, a patient's a distress, distress patient in front of us, and they need some kind of treatment uh, when there is a um, delay in terms of surgery. How, how do you cope with this kind of patient? I mean, you, you uh, probably don't see them upfront, but you are referred. Uh, to uh, you as an oncologist, I mean. Correct, correct. So, so a couple of things. So regarding hormones, I think there is, there is even newer data showing that for intermediate risk prostate cancer and some high risk prostate cancers, even hormones with radiation might not be the way to go. We're probably, uh, see, we're seeing more and more data that even with radiation, we're gonna have to use less hormones. Yeah. Second, we have the added morbidity of for all this um, uh, hormone therapy that we have to factor. I think we know more and more about hormones right now. They are not as, as, uh, as simple and as, and as easy to manage as we originally thought. And then the third thing, a lot of what we do is education. We know, and uh, from the data that, that I've seen, that I've showed you, and that we have seen in many other publications, is a wait of three to six months is unlikely going to make a difference uh, from a, a survival point of view. So a lot of it's education and talking to patients. Fortunately, in more, most pa places, we haven't had a wave that will last six months. So we just tell the patients it's gonna be a three months uh, longer. Uh, I hope uh, none of you uh, have been faced with this situation of having to postpone people for six months longer than, than what they were already waiting when they were in their wait list. I don't know, I'm happy to hear from anyone else if there, but to me, it's been a lot of a, about education of uh, in prostate cancer. Oh, that's the same here. Anyone mm -hmm. have any thoughts here? Another, another issue. Um, Are you, I was gonna say something, yeah. I think. Ola Maria, come on, please. No, 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 I, I was completely agree with you. I think that uh, we need to educate our patients and that the, not to use the hormones to, to calm the anxiety is just to, to give the right therapy at the right moment. And in fact, we have not been able to demonstrate for any risk disease in prostate cancer, which is the delay that compromises the overall survival. Mm. So still we don't have evidence on that. So just for waiting for three, four months, I think that the anxiety can be managed with information also, as you said. Another thing you touch upon also, Ricardo, was the fact that uh, using filter devices in terms of laparoscopic surgery and so forth, um, we, we do it in a couple of centers in Sweden and some other countries across Europe, but do, is it mandatory in Canada right now? To use uh, filters? Yes. Well, it's, it's not mandatory, it's a recommendation because no one really made any mandatory recommendations in, uh, in Canada about this. Uh, for those who want to learn about this, the SAGES uh, website, the, the, the American uh, Society of uh, Endoscopic Laparoscopic Surgery, uh, has a great table with all the filters and what viruses and the size of the particles that, are, that will um, block or not block. So that's a good resource to have. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much, Ben. I think for the time, we have to continue. So thank you very much, Ricardo, for your excellent presentation. So we have the last speaker today, um, Mark Lynch from University College of London. He's going to give us uh, thoughts about not only hormonal treatment, but also a little bit more aggressive treatment uh, in terms of side effects and so forth in COVID-19 era. So please welcome Mark Lynch. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak today and I'm very happy to be involved in this educational event. 
So I'm going to try and weave together some of the information we have in terms of cardiovascular risk factors and COVID in advanced prostate cancers. So this first slide here is an overview of the, the progression schema of prostate cancer, starting from the clinically localized disease on the left, going through to metastatic castrate resistant disease on the right. And so this would be very familiar to, to those that treat prostate cancer on a regular basis. The purpose of this slide really is just to show about the explosion of different treatment options. So the treatment landscape of prostate cancer. This is not only in the metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer setting, but also bringing it forward into the non-metastatic castrate resistant setting and the metastatic hormone sensitive settings. So you can see there's a mixture of hormones, chemo hormonal therapy, but more recently, we've got radionuclide therapy, several different options, and we've got immunotherapies. So this talk, I'm going to focus mainly on hormones, but also just going to point out a couple of other things, including immunotherapy. So this slide is to show just particularly for hormone therapy that, that there's been a changing landscape. And we've shown that second generation hormonal agents like enzalutamide, like abiraterone, are effective in prolonging survival and managing symptoms. But if we start on the right hand side here, and this is the AFFIRM study looking at metastatic castrate resistant disease, we have a, a survival benefit measured in a few months. If we bring it, gradually bring it forward in the, the disease course, the hazard ratio stays very similar. But because the patient's survival earlier in the disease is better, that hazard ratio converts into an overall survival benefit of significantly more months. And you can see here on the PROSPER study, we've got over 10 month overall survival benefit by adding enzalutamide, whereas compare that to the AFFIRM study, where you've got approximately you know, just under a five month benefit. So just bringing it forward, you get more benefit. So as a general rule, we're bringing forward our effective therapies. And that means we're bringing forward the toxicities of these treatments, including cardiovascular toxicities. So what are the cardiovascular toxicities? Well, looking at one of these trials, this is the Enzymet study, which is looking at the use of enzalutamide plus ADT in newly diagnosed hormone sensitive uh, prostate, metastatic prostate cancer. And I really just want to draw your attention to the toxicities in this right hand side of the slide. So the major serious toxicities, the grade three to five toxicities, are actually cardiovascular problems. So hypertension, syncope possibly could be related to cardiovascular, myocardial infarction and chest pain from a cardiac cause. They're all more prominent with enzalutamide. That was a single study. If you look at the meta-analysis, looking particularly at abiraterone and enzalutamide. So these are the two main second generation uh, hormonal agents that we've been using for the treatment of advanced prostate cancers. And actually what we can see is that all grade cardiovascular toxicity for these two agents is more significant for if you if we're having the, the second generation hormonal treatments compared to not. The serious toxicities are significantly more and uh, you can see that this is 3.7 versus 2% for cardiovascular toxicity as a whole, and hypertension, particularly 6.1 versus 3.1%. As a rule, abiraterone has got both cardiovascular toxicities and hypertension, whereas the enzalutamide is just pre uh, predominantly hypertension alone. So we changed the guidelines in response to COVID. And so there's two things I want you to take away from this slide. The first one was just generally for systemic anti-cancer therapies. And what it really meant is that because we were limiting resources and because we were concerned about the potential risk of making people immunosuppressed during particularly the first wave of COVID, uh, we, we had to, we integrated this priority level. So we had six different levels for systemic therapy. And at our institution, we judged that we would have to stop levels of five and six. So we weren't treating people unless they, they are having uh, a palliative systemic therapy, which was going to give at least one year life, ex life extension. If they're having less than one year, we wouldn't treat. And we were not treating with systemic therapies that only gave a palliative benefit. 
Then there were some interim COVID-19 guidelines which came out from NICE, so that's our efficacy and cost effectiveness agency. And the interesting thing that, that they showed for prostate cancer is they gave us access to the second generation hormones, enzalutamide, for hormone sensitive disease. Whereas previously, based on the Stampede study conducted in the UK and Switzerland, we, we gave docetaxel in this setting. So we stopped giving docetaxel for these patients and switched it to enzalutamide. So we would perceive or consider that there'll be more enzalutamide toxicity as a result of this COVID-19 change. Subsequent to this, a number of papers have come out looking at the, the risk of COVID in patients who've had hormonal therapy or chemotherapy. And this is actually predominantly chemotherapy. And it looks as though chemotherapy doesn't contribute to worse outcomes for COVID-19 at least in solid tumor malignancies, including prostate cancer, it looks as though outcomes may be worse in hematological malignancies. Very early on in the, in the epidemic or pandemic, there was a concern about steroids. And we use a lot of steroids in the management of prostate cancer. And in fact, this advice from CDC and WHO back in February, early March of last year, said to avoid corticosteroid therapy. And this was about the concern about the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, showing that influenza had a delayed viral clearance with steroids. So that was the initial guidance. And this came out in a number of guidelines, including rheumatological guidelines, um, respiratory guidelines. And there was a feeling amongst oncologists that maybe we should decrease the amount of steroids that we were giving. Actually, we came out and said something very different that we didn't think that was a very safe thing to be doing. We think there were beneficial anti-cancer effects of both physiological doses of steroids and super physiological doses for acute things like cord compression. So we, we uh, implored a case by case decision and saying that steroids have important benefits. And I think some of that was justified in subsequent recovery study, which is shown here on the right, which was using dexamethasone in an ITU setting or in the setting of high dependency where patients with COVID were being, and on a ventilator were being treated. And it showed that there was significant reduction in hospital stays and outcomes associated with, or improvement in outcomes associated with dexamethasone therapy. So the other thing that the guidelines have showed, are these are our interim COVID guidelines, also said that we, we would have access to immunotherapy. Now, that's just, this is predominantly from the, tr the treatments that, or the conditions I treat, this is in uh, urothelial malignancies, not prostate cancer. However, we did continue to treat immunotherapy within clinical trials. So we've continued to do this pretty much throughout the pandemic, except for March and April of last year. And this is one of the toxicities that we've encountered. And so this is again, weaving into a potential cardiac toxicity. So a 62 year old man who presented with very high PSA, nodal and bo bony mets, had had previous ADT as a monotherapy and then moved on to enzalutamide in the setting of castrate resistant disease. And the patient went on to a study of both nivolumab and ipilimumab. As expected with these kind of treatments, this the PD-1 inhibitor and the CTLA-4 inhibitor, it did get some toxicities, including thyroiditis and some mild colitis. The patient was then admitted, and this was, uh, this was about 12 weeks after starting treatment, admitted with some chest pain, shoulder pain and breathlessness. And the concerns at this time is, could this be an MI? Could this be a PE? The ECG had shown a sinus tachycardia, the troponin was normal, the CTPA had not demonstrated a PE, but there was an incidental finding of thickening of the aorta. So an FDG PET scan was performed, and I hadn't seen these scans before but the, uh, in, in this setting, but I, was, I thought they were a beautiful picture, so I wanted to share it with you today. Uh, it showed a large vessel vasculitis. And so this is at the top here, you can see the, the green FDG avidity around the intimal layer on the left, and you can see that it's the arch of the aorta going to the descending aorta right down to the diaphragm on this picture. Um, the patient was treated with steroids successfully, and this is, take, this is the scan six months later with complete resolution of those radiological changes on the PET scan. So my conclusion is there's a plethora of new agents for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. Each has a different cardiovascular toxicity. COVID-19 has led to less use of chemotherapy, but more use of hormonal therapy. 
steroids are useful for both prostate cancer and COVID, and immunotherapy may be COVID safe and has distinct cardiovascular toxicities. So this now draws us on to the discussion part of the, of the evening. Um, I think I'll hand back over to our chair. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Mark, yeah, for your presentation. Um, let's see if I'm online now. Yes, can you hear me now? Uh, I think uh, well, it's related to, to uh, COVID-19, of course. Uh, what I understand from you is uh, earlier introduction of um, um, hormone therapy, as you said in the take-home message. Um, but when you evaluate whether early introduction of um, ensalutamide, abiraterone, and other systemic therapies can prolong a patient's uh, overall survival, how do you um, estimate what kind of patients should be excluded from, uh, uh, for instance, uh, chemotherapy? Uh, and uh, how do you estimate uh, life expectancy in these patients, whether, whenever you introduce, I mean, uh, systemic therapy. You said also in the beginning there is a trend toward, towards early introduction using ensalutamide and abiraterone, and that trend has perhaps uh, now been diminished a little bit due to COVID-19. Is that true? So, so actually, uh, our experience in, so I think introducing earlier hormonal therapy is, is being governed by the evidence base. We've, we've seen that by bringing it forward in the treatment course, we can get more benefit from the same agent. So we've been trying to introduce it earlier and earlier, um, notwithstanding the toxicity. And that's obviously the most important consideration is how do we counteract or protect from getting those toxicities. And that's why uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, is highly uh, well, busied by our practice. We try and engage him at an early early point to make sure we can overcome any potential long-term cardiac toxicities. Uh, so we know that overall survival benefit is, is there using it earlier. And, and I think the COVID guidance has actually given, it just happens in the UK, it's given us greater access to use these agents. So we've certainly been using those more. In terms of how that governs uh, our, our outcome and our overall survival, I think that's been guided very nicely by, by the clinical studies. And we now know that um, you know, we can now estimate that patients who've got metastatic disease in this setting, their life expectancy would be measured in, in certainly more than three years using these approaches. Well, a mandatory question is about using steroids in, in patients with COVID-19 because we have found uh, many reports that COVID-19 uh, varies also treatment, including steroids and um, it can be interfere. There can be interference. Well, what's your point in terms of steroids and COVID, as you alluded to earlier? So, so I don't think there has been data. There, there's not been information to show that the use of steroids actually predisposes to um, worse outcomes with COVID in terms of more likelihood of becoming infected, or increasing the duration of infection. And certainly, that recovery study, which is a, was a UK base study which has, has clearly shown that in patients who are started on high dose steroids at the time of requiring mechanical ventilation get imp shorter hospital stays and a higher survival. So my point is continue to use steroids when you think it is appropriate oncologically. Yeah, no, no that's pretty much um, uh, what we, uh, not too much literature says, but I mean, there are reports that you can continue to use, and especially if you're highly infected with COVID and intubated and so forth. It makes a difference in terms of uh, survival. So, so uh, any questions for the uh, remaining panelists, actually? I, I just have a question for Mark. Um, we had a bit of a shortage of uh, dexamethasone. So when we were switching patients on Abbey um, PrEP, when they were progressing to DEXA, we ran out of it, and which is an ideal situation before because you don't want to start them on chemo just yet for those progress. Yeah. I don't wonder if you had the same problem with DEXA or no. That's not actually something that we we experienced. So we didn't have any DEXA shortage. Um, I'm not sure why that that is why why you would have had it and we wouldn't. But no, yeah. so it's not something that I can comment on really. Okay. 
Uh, there was, there's, I, I, I would like to just comment on the vaccine question that Kate was asked earlier by one of the audience. So the, the, the UK chemotherapy guidance group have, have come out with some guidelines about vaccinations in conjunction with chemotherapy. And essentially it's to affirm that we, we don't have any con concerns about having the vaccine for patients during chemotherapy. The advice is just broadly empirical. We said try not to have it within 24 hours either side of having had the chemotherapy. Having said that, the King's Group in London have recently published uh, non-peer reviewed data, which shows that outcomes in patients who are having chemotherapy may the um, the response to the vaccine may be impaired. So while I while I'm still endorsing certainly having the vaccine for all patients, it is possible that the vaccine is less effective if patients are on chemotherapy. If a patient is infected with COVID nineteen, uh, do you use um, less now? What I can understand, uh, chemotherapy in these patients. Yeah, so we wouldn't we would if they certainly if they've got active infection, we wouldn't use it. We've uh, there's not evidence to base this but or back this up. But what we've been doing is. We're waiting for two clear PCR tests and then 10 days after that. Okay. But again, that's empirical. All right. Any more questions from the panelists? We have a few, uh, two, more, four, two more minutes, actually, <laughs> before we have to uh, finalize this, this um, webinar. Um, any questions from you, Maria? No, no. What about you, Ayun? Any remaining questions? There is a question for Arjun in, in the chat. It uh, says, what proportion of men with prostate cancer are, are at high cardiovascular risk? So that's, that's a very good question. I think um, difficult to maybe quantify the percentage, but if you consider the demographic of patients who develop prostate cancer, uh, male, uh, given the age, a lot of them will have pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, uh, baseline cardiovascular disease in terms of um, increased cholesterol. So I think um, the better answer to the question is that when a patient with prostate cancer does present, when they are going to be put on treatment, which can cause a variety of cardiovascular issues, please do assess the patient in terms of, is the blood pressure elevated? Are they on treatment? What is the cholesterol like? And this doesn't have to be done by the urologist. This doesn't have to be done by the oncologist. It can be done by their primary physician. But I think that you know when you're assessing the patient, um, a view on their cardiac risk factors and referral to the primary physician to assess that is very beneficial in the long term. Any final question? Otherwise, we have come to an end. Thank you very much, all panelists, uh, for joining this webinar. It's been uh, really informative, and I think all the candidates out there, whether they are cardiologists, oncologists, or urologists, I found a lot of take-home messages, actually, how to handle these patients from COVID-19. So thank you very much, all of you. I would like to have a final slide to introduce the next webinar. Yes. So we have the uh, uh, module three coming up uh, in September. The first 2021 20, and the final one, module four, Future Directions PC, uh, A, or Prostate Cancer Management um, by the middle of November 2021. So you're indeed very welcome to join us. And this is a very good collaboration between Canadian Urologic Association and ICOS, International uh, Community of Oncological uh, Cardiologists, and finally, uh, European Association. Uh, helping us with all the presentations and uh, this um, broadcast here tonight. So thank you very much again, all of you. Um, ex excellent, actually. Have a good evening and uh, thanks for attending. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.